Again, so welcome back everyone to uh, lecture four. This is a, um, an English 1120 and um, uh, time in history in, in uh, literature. Um, tonight, we're gonna take on part two of uh, our discussion of uh, Virgil's uh, Aeneid. And uh, I was saying, I, I'm looking forward to that. It's one of my favorite works overall. Um, uh, but before we get started, let's uh, go over some housekeeping. Tomorrow, of course, you have an assignment due, um, your first assignment. Uh, I hope people are not sweating about it too much. It's uh, a fairly straightforward assignment, uh, 100 to 150 words, your impression. No question. I keep getting this via email. No questions to answer your impressions and thoughts on one of the works we've studied. So one of the works, either the Odyssey or the, the Iliad, and you can post that in the discussion forum. Are there any questions on the assignment that's due tomorrow at five? So it's due tomorrow at 5 p.m. Um, I have a question. Isabel. Um, so I did mine, I just responded to someone. Does that count too? Yes, it does, okay. very good question. So uh, anyone else, maybe again, show of hands. Okay, uh, not seeing any, any other questions on that. I'll move, I'll move on to the Aeneid, uh, but um, of course you can, as we go through the discussion, raise your hand if you wanna comment on either the Aeneid or if, if something occurs to you about, about the assignment, okay? Um, so last time, I just wanna do a quick, quick overview of what we discussed last time, because we went through a lot of information there. So just what are some of the things we talked about? Because we, we, we did a general overview of what's going on in the Aeneid. So we, we talked about, about the Aeneid as a foundation myth. We talked about well, who is Aeneid, how, Aeneas, how do we know Aeneas? And, and we talked about how we, we first come to know Aeneas in the Iliad, and he's known for his devotion to the gods in the Iliad. Um, and when he's saved by Poseidon in that work. Uh, we talked a little bit about the importance of the Aeneid to the, to the Western tradition in terms of how it's become a foundational work. Um, we talked a bit about uh, the background of Virgil, the author. Uh, we talked about um, some of the themes that are, are pertinent, at least for this course, but really stand out in the work uh, generally uh, being piety, the piety of Aeneas, or that is, let's say, a goal for the reader, for the Roman reader, for the, for the present reader. Um, we talked about how that, that theme of, of piety uh, can be seen to be in tension with, with uh, madness uh, in, in both its form of anger or, or love. Um, and then I'll just remind you what piety is, you know, it has a very broad definition. So uh, piety, probably the best definition of it is is because we, in our current usage of that word, it probably it has a strictly religious context. But for uh, for Virgil's context, piety means more so performing one's duty to all to whom one has a duty. So so uh, I know that's a bit convoluted, but. Uh, so someone has a duty, uh, let's say, I, I sometimes try to put myself in that role. Okay, so I have a certain set of duties, like I'm a father, I have duties that are non-negotiable for my kids, you know, I've got to be there for them. I'm a, I'm a husband, so I have a certain duty to, to my, my wife and, um, and her family, and I have duty to my other family members, uh, my extended family. I have a duty to uh, to to parents, I, my my parents personally are no no longer around, but when they were here, I had I had a duty to them. Um, so you, we can see that in Aeneas in terms of his familial duty, his familial responsibilities in all those three directions, four directions. Um, one has a duty to um, the community, and 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 for Aeneas, that is the uh, the, the absolutely important act of founding the community of Rome. Um, um, maybe others in our own lives, we have a, a smaller bit part to play, but we have a duty to the community. Um, we have a duty to whatever one conceives of as something higher than, than you know, your own meager existence. Is there something, is there some sort of 
spiritual uh, force or, or, or uh, uh, purpose to which you can, can devote your, your energies, your thoughts, your life. So, so all that's kind of wrapped up in this sense of Aeneas being pious. It's not just a matter of him being showing devotion to the gods. It's also him performing all of his duties. So when, um, importantly in book four, he, uh, he, when he leaves Carthage and, and abandons Dido, and, there's, and that can be seen as very cold on the one hand, and, and certainly it is that. And then on the other hand, if you say, well, that's Aeneas being pious, that's him fulfilling his duty to, well, first of all, to honor the gods, because they told him this is what he had to do, but also to fulfill his, his political communal duty there. So, so we talked about that as a theme, piety in relationship to its, its kind of opposite in, in losing oneself in passions, in madness, you know, that type of thing. Um, the isolation of Aeneas, we talked a, a bit about that in, in a few examples throughout the, throughout the Aeneid, where he's, he, uh, in order to, in a way, be pious Aeneas, he has to kind of sacrifice himself and he, he ends up, you know, being somewhat isolated. Um, we talked about the structure of the Aeneid, so I've asked you to read a few books from the first half, and that's called the Odyssean half, the 20, he's wandering, so the structure mirrors, uh, in a way, both epics of Homer, so in the first six books, there's wandering, and then the last six books, we have this uh, war on a, on a, on a, a future homeland. Um, so uh, that, that structure is important. And what's also important to think about in that structure when we talk about book six very quickly tonight will be how book six is kind of a hinge between the two as, as it's seen as a crucial turning point. We talked about the cultural background in, in Greek myth a bit and, and the end in the, in the myths around the Trojan War. And we talked a bit about the historical context of the rise and decline of the Roman Republic and how in that decline, there had been about a century of civil wars of different, of different varieties. And that the, the epic, the Aeneid, is written really in the shadow of that. Uh, over a hundred years of civil war where you can only imagine people are desperate for anything that would provide some sort of sense of order and peace. So, so Aeneas, to some extent, is, is one who after defeating the Italians in the, the second half of the book does provide that sort of order. And he does provide a parallel to Augustus who in the historical context had also provided that sort of order. Um, so that's uh, basically a very high level what we went over last week. Now, to get started this week, I wanna look at the opening uh, lines of of the epic, can uh, do we? Does everyone see the um, the text, uh, the PDF of the Aeneid there? I'm hopefully sharing. Yes, we can see it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so yeah, these are the opening lines, and we'll talk a bit about them. So I'll read them first, and then we'll 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 go to some, some of the presentation bullet points on, on, on things to take away from this. So wars and a man I sing, an exile driven on by fate. He was the first to flee the coast of Troy, destined to reach Lavinian shores and Italian soil. Yet many blows he took on land and sea before the gods above, thanks to cruel Juno's relentless rage and many losses he bore in battle too before he could found a city, bring his gods to Latium, source of the Latin race, the Alban lords and the high walls of Rome. Tell me, muse, how it all began. Why was Juno outraged? What could wound the queen of the gods with all her power? Why did she force a man so famous for his devotion to brave such rounds of hardship, bear such trials? Can such rage inflame the immortals' hearts? So, uh, any, well, let's, any particular, let's say, comments or impressions on that upon reading it? Thoughts?
Does anyone, uh, in terms of the invocation of the muse, do we have an invocation of the muse? And if so, where in that uh, excerpt we just read? Could you put the lines back up? Yeah, I'll do that. That's a good idea. So any takers can raise your hands. So I'm gonna pick someone at random. Uh, Christopher Bruce. What are your what are your thoughts on these opening lines? Are you there, Christopher? This is the audience participation portion of the program. You can always go different directions. So I'm gonna, tr I'll try Aiden then. Aiden? There's no any any thoughts on on the, these opening lines. Um, the this? second. Oh. Go ahead. Who is this? Uh, Isabel. Okay, go ahead. Um, the second part. It seems like someone's really like sad or angry because they keep asking questions. Okay, so good point. So uh, there's the the second part of that after the tell me muse. Okay. So that, I would call that the invocation. So he doesn't know this, right? So he knows, he knows generally that there's a story. So the narrator saying that, I wanna sing about wars and a man, okay? Uh, an exile driven by fate. Cause I know generally that there was this war and there were other wars and there was the Trojan war and then these wars in Italy and of the, of the man, Aeneas, who was an integral part of both of those. and. And, driven, and this person was driven on by fate to found, to flee Troy and to found a new city. So I know that, but what I don't know are some of these questions. Tell me, Muse, how it all began. And why was Juno outraged? Why, why would Juno be the source of this? And what could wound uh, uh, the queen of the gods? So what I don't know are kind of divine motivations behind the apparent. So. So I'm going to need some sort of as a, this divine inspiration to be able to tell that story. How else does one know that, right? Um, and so there's a certain sadness there, I guess. I, one way, yeah, that's one way of putting it. I would say another one would be kind of just perplexity at why, uh, why, or um, why would rage inflame the hearts of immortal gods does that does it terrorize them as much as it terrorizes us you know what i mean so so could does does can such rage inflame the immortals hearts as it does here you know after we've as i said been in through 100 years of civil war where where human rage has has torn apart lives for so long does does it also tear apart the lives of the gods so to speak in different ways either as passion, love, or passion, anger. So in a way, we have you know, kind of Juno and Venus, who represent both sides of that here. Um, so let's go to, uh, I'll go to some slides here. And uh, as, as I said, as, as always, just let me know if you want to jump in with a question. But uh, I want to point out a couple of things there. I, I, as I pointed out the, the invocation already, but the other thing I want to point out is, as with the structure and as with, well, a lot of the allusions to, to Homer, um, uh, 
uh, we have in the first line a reference to um, both ethics in the first words. Okay, so in in Latin it's uh, arma virunque cano. So uh, literally would be of arms and of a man I sing. So the cano is I sing. And Virunke is the of a man, you know, and Arma is of arms. So arms, in a way, refers to the main theme of the Iliad. So it, the first word of the Iliad is wrath. Um, so the wrath of Achilles. So tell me, muse, about the wrath of Achilles. But the first word is the wrath of Achilles. And its subject is the war around this wrath, you know. And then the first word of the Odyssey is, is man or Andra. So tell me about the, this, this weird man, this man of many twists and turns, Odysseus. Um, so in the first line, brilliantly, he's, he's kind of taken the first lines of both of the previous epics. Um, and, and the larger goal of the epic is stressed from the very beginning as well. So the fact that Aeneas is fated to found the Roman people, and that's what this story is about, um, and the inevitability of Rome, that it is fated. Uh, and uh, I think the, an important point to keep in mind is, although there's fate in, in, the, in the Odyssey, remember we, we looked at the prophecy that's described to Odysseus in the underworld by Tiresias. So there is a certain fatedness there, uh, but it's about Odysseus's fate, right? It's about uh, his personal journey, so to speak. It has implications for others, certainly, but here the fate is, is taken to a higher level in terms of being about the greater goals of the city of, and of his society, right? So we also learn about the characters of three key gods. So we're gonna learn about Juno, Venus, and uh, Jupiter. So uh, these are the Roman, the Roman equivalents of the Greek gods, Hera, Aphrodite, and Zeus, okay? So Jupiter, like they're etymologically connected. So Jupiter is, is Zeus Pater, the father, father god, the sky father god. They're, they're, they're all connected as, as uh, within a tree of Indo-European uh, 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 sky deities that have very similar names. <clears throat> um, well, let's see a comment here. Christopher, Christopher Bruce, sorry, my mic isn't working. Oh yeah, because I had asked Christopher to jump in. My thoughts are that the question this rage was put down on him. Sorry. My my thoughts are that the that he questions this rage was put down on him. I guess why was this rage put down on him? Clearly, the queen of the gods had undergone immense hardship for it to be reflected onto mortals. Yes, good point. Thanks, Christopher. Um so uh so the first uh the first goddess we hear about here is it is is Juno. Um, so after that opening that I just that we just read, you know, how why is she so why is she so upset? You know, like what why and can and can rage inflame the hearts of the immortals as well. Uh, he goes on to, well, here are the reasons, you know, well she's upset over the judgment of Paris. So we talked about that last time as part of the mythical background. The founder of Troy, Dardanus, was an illeg illegitimate son of Jupiter, so one of Jupiter's many affairs. Over Ganymede, who the, uh, the Trojan prince had abducted by Jupiter and became another, another one of Jupiter's uh, love objects, so to speak. Uh, and over the fate of Carthage, so Carthage had, uh, which one of her favorite cities, and he, she knew that the fate of, of that city would be, remember we talked about that in the historical context as well, that they were, Carthage would be this very important enemy for Rome in, in the early days of its history, it fought three major wars with it, finally destroying it. And this epic comes along, written after all of those wars, looking back and saying how this was all part of a divine plan almost. Um, we learn about Venus in the sense we know that she's concerned for her son 
uh, Aeneas. She tries to help him by appealing to, to Jupiter, because, uh, um, sorry to back up, I'll just remind you that Juno, Juno is in rage. We, we first turn to her, uh, see her in, uh, in as much as she goes to Aeolus to, uh, to, to bribe him to, um, to stir up some winds that will prevent Aeneas from getting to Italy. Um, Venus sees all this and appeals to Jupiter and you know says, why is this going? I thought you said that he was fated. I thought you said my son was fated to start a new Troy and found a new city. And how, why are you letting, letting her get away with all this? Um, Venus uh, then appears in disguise. Juno, sorry, we'll talk about that in a second, but Ju Jupiter then assuages her and says, you know, everything is going to be okay. Don't worry. That fate is still um, uh, still standing. Um, uh, you will, you know, bide your time, uh, and uh, uh, don't. I will ensure that the fate unfolds the way it should. She then goes to see Aeneas to help facilitate his next steps. He had, uh, he and his colleagues had um, landed in the shores of Carthage and Lord knows what the reception could be. So she helps to ensure that he's going to receive a positive uh, reception at the hands of the Carthaginians. Um, she man manipulates Dido to fall in love with Aeneas uh, by, um, by disguising Cupid so you know the baby with the wings and the arrow that you see on Valentine's card. So, uh, so that is her her child, and is is an agent for causing mortals to fall in love with one another. So, um, uh, she uh, disguises Cupid as uh, Ascanius, Aeneas's son, and um, uh, the evening that's described at the end of book one. This disguised Ascanius, actually Cupid, is is hanging out, is sitting on Dido's lap, and and Dido is falling helplessly in love with Aeneas at Venus's uh, bidding. Jupiter. We then learn about Jupiter. Um, um, I think it might be useful to go to that section actually and to to read that. Rather than um, rather than just describe it, so um, <clears throat> so this is his reply. So Venus has just appealed to Jupiter. So the. the the overarching ruler of all the gods. Um, she's appealed to him that, I thought you told me that his, his fate was to found a new city, et cetera. Uh, he responds, relieve yourself of fear, my lady of Cythera. The fate of your children stands unchanged, I swear. You will see your promised city, see Lavinium's walls and bury your great-hearted Aeneas up to the stars on high. Nothing has changed my mind. So there, with that reference, it makes it sound like it's, it's uh, Jupiter's will that determines the future. And later we'll see that maybe he, it makes it sound like he's just reading the scroll of fate. So to some extent, there's two senses of the relationship between fate and Jupiter here. So is, is Jupiter, like are the decrees of Jupiter fate, is it one and the same, like the will of Zeus is fate? Or is fate something that happens, but that Zeus, given, given his, his overarching power, is able to see and, 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 um, and, and, and predict? Um, no, your son, believe me, since anguish is gnawing at you, I will tell you more, unrolling the scroll of fate to reveal its darkest secrets. Aeneas will wage a long, costly war in Italy, crush defiant tribes, and build high city walls for his people there and found the rule of law. So I just want to look at one image, one image that's persistent in um, a lot of texts for thinking about 
the unfolding of things in time, okay? So often it's very parallel to reading, okay? So it's in the, re the text of the reading, okay? So it's a really long book. It's gonna take a lot of time to read it, right? So if you've got a very thick book, the passage of time can be visualized as where that bookmark is through, through that book that you're reading. So the, the image of, um, of, of that unfolding in time in the ancient world, because this is pre-codex. So a codex is a book like this that's, that's, that's bound with leaves like that, okay? So a codex is a bound book as, as we know it. Um, so before that, uh, where we, we, you had a, things were like scrolls of different, uh, on different material, um, the image is of time unrolling, so to speak, as opposed to flipping. So time unrolling. So if, if fate is written chronologically in the scroll, we've got to roll through the scroll and un, un, uh, unroll it, so to speak, to get to the future. Uh, as opposed to, you know, just let's skip ahead to the end. You know, uh, we think about that, like we say, okay, well, let's try to skip ahead to the end of a book or in time, can we fast forward? People will say that, like, I want to fast forward to the end because they're using a, the visual, uh, the video metaphor of whether it's a, a, a DVD player or, a, 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 or, a, or, or some sort of, uh, a, you know, YouTube video, they can fast forward to the end of it. Um, so all that to say, the, the notion of time and our moving back and forth in it has to do with uh, the medium of how we tell our stories as well as the story itself. So the medium here is or how the story is written down, you know, it, whether it's a scroll, a book, written down in a video, like a cinematography. The graphine there is Greek for writing. Um, okay. Um, Aeneas will wage a long, costly war in Italy, crush defiant tribes, and build high city walls for his people there and found the rule of law. So very important there about founding the rule of law. Only three summers will see him govern Latium. Three winters pass in barracks after the Latins have been broken. But his son, Ascanius, now that he gains the name of Eulus, Eulus he was, while Ilium ruled on high, will fill out with his own reign 30 sovereign years, a giant cycle of months revolving round and round, transferring his rule from its old Lavinian home to raise up Alba Longa's mighty ramparts, okay? So uh, that's a, a long-winded way of saying Ascanius, Aeneas's son. Another name for Ascanius is Eulus, which he wants to underline because it's going to be linked to the later name of Julius. So Julius Caesar, but the Julius Caesar we know, but Augustus also has Julius as part of his name. And that name is tied to Elus, which is um, Troy in Greek, okay? So the Iliad is the story about Troy, okay? So uh, the uh, Elus is a reference to Troy, and it, it's a name rooted in Troy. From that, he, that's why his name is Eulus, which will become Julius, which becomes those great emperors. Um, and he will rule for 30 years in the city that is founded, Lavinium, by, by, by Aeneas, um, and then go uh, found uh, Alba Longa, a new city, okay? Um, and then there in turn for 300 years. So, so those, that's the progression. So, so Aeneas will be there, fight a war for three years. Ascanius will rule for 30 years. A passage of time of 300 years will take place between these events and uh, the next events, which, were, which are Romulus and Remus that we're about to describe here. There in turn, for a full 300 years, the dynasty of Hector will hold sway till Ilia, a royal priestess, great with the brood of Mars. So this priestess will become pregnant from, from Mars, the deity, and will bear the twin, the, the god twin sons. Then one Romulus, 
reveling in the tawny pelt of a wolf that nursed him will inherit the line and build the walls of Mars after his own name, call his people Romans. Okay, so we talked about that last week, Romulus and Remus. They're the sons of, of Mars and this, and this priestess. Uh, this occurs 300 years after the events that are being described here, according to Virgil. And Romulus will kill his brother and then found Rome. So this is all, that's all described in the scrolls of fate that Jupiter is reading now to Venus. On them I set no limits, space or time. So right off early in the epic, Virgil's underlining how, and this, you know, this is for a Roman audience, an audience that, of Romans that are rightly proud of their, their, their empire that, that, that controls most of the known world at that time. On them I set no limits of space or time. So space, they're going to control as much territory as they want, and it will endure as long as they want. I have granted them power, empire without end, even furious Juno now plaguing the land and sea and sky with terror. She will mend her ways and hold dear with me. These Romans, lords of the earth, the race arrayed in togas, this is my pleasure, my decree. So again, it sounds like this is his fate or fatum, what is decreed is just Zeus's decree. Indeed, an age will come as the long years slip by when Asarachus, royal house, will quell Achilles' homeland, brilliant Mycenae too, and enslave their people, rule defeated Argos. So this is, the story is also about turning the tables on the Greeks. So we're going to borrow their cultural traditions, but we're going to turn it on them, so to speak. Um, we'll borrow the epic form, the epic tradition, a lot of stories around it, but it will be um, done in such a way that, that the Greeks are seen as inferior to the Romans to some extent, although it's, it's called almost a dialectical interplay. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, the other thing I'll just note, I won't read it, but what's also celebrated there is um, how down at the, towards the last lines, the terrible gates of war. So he's predicting how ultimately with Augustus, peace will come. The terrible gates of war with their welded iron bars will stand bolted shut and locked inside. The frenzy of civil strife will crouch down on his savage weapons, hands pinioned behind his back with a hundred brazen shackles, monstrously roaring, roaring out from his bloody jaws. So um, what he predicts, this glorious victory that he predicts is, is also uh, the glorious um, conquering of the um, civil strife by Augustus. Okay, so it's so key in the background here. Um, so I think we, addressed most of those points on Jupiter as we went through. So we also learn about Aeneas in the, the, the obviously in the first book, we uh, learn a great deal about him in his first speech. Uh, so Juno has, has gotten the Aeolus to, uh, to churn up the winds. His first speech uh, is one of despair. He alludes to wishing that he had uh, been, uh, had died earlier um, in, in Troy. Um, and then his second speech after they've landed in the uh, in Carthage is one where it's a public speech. So the first one's private where he's expressing kind of his, his private emotions, so to speak, of, of despair. Like I wish I had died in, in, in Troy. It would have been better to die there than suffer here uh, continuously. Um, the second speech is in front of his comrades, he's, he's trying to rouse them, right? So his there, the it's um, it's more of a public discourse. Again, this is part of that the sacrifice of the private and say the concerns of the inner Aeneas have to be sacrificed for the public Aeneas. Um, the under the the. The narrator underscores this tension between the public and private after the, the second speech. Um, 
if, uh, let's say, yeah, the other thing I want to just underscore there, I won't, won't turn to it, but I've, I've given you the line numbers there, is in his first speech, he says, I wish I had died in Troy uh, before the faces of my fathers. And this, this kind of phrase comes up a lot, okay, in the Aeneid. So uh, dying before the faces of parents, anti ora parentum. So um, it's a recurring motif, um, signifying, I think we could say, the threat throughout the poem to, there's this so-called fate there that's being presented, but the danger that's presented, the fate that you know, Aeneas is also ultimately going to found Rome, but there were these dangers he had to overcome. We know he did it. We know because we're living in the shadow of that, and Virgil's readers know that too, but the dangers were dangers to the future, the destiny of Rome. So, so children dying before their parents is the death of, of a promised future, so to speak. Um, so, uh, I won't go through this speech, but this is his second speech to his comrades, cheering them up. And then the narrator undercuts this. So, so he's saying, you know, don't worry, we've been through worse, we'll get through the through worse, we'll get through this. And then the narrator's words after that is, is brave words, sick with mounting cares, he assumes a look of hope and keeps his anguish buried in his heart. Um, and uh, as I note here, it, it We'll see Milton definitely alluding to this passage when uh, he has the narrator similarly early on in Paradise Lost, the first book of Paradise Lost, undercut the brave words of Satan. So Satan is our first character we, we, we encounter in that book, saying brave words again. And the narrator, again, brave words rousing up his, his comrade, this time Beelzebub, and, and the narrator undercats that by saying, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. Again, this, the narrator knows what's underneath the public veil of rhetoric. So others might not know that, you know, out in, in our everyday appearance, we don't necessarily know what's beyond the veil of rhetoric that a public figure uh, is presenting in their public speeches. But, uh, but the poet is inferring some sort of knowledge of what's happening internally as well. And we know that in the case of both Aeneas and Satan, it's, it's deep despair at this point. Um, so here's an excerpt here. We won't go, I won't go to it, but I'll re refer you to it, is where Aeneas sees the temple uh, to Juno in Carthage and sees depictions of the Trojan war on its walls. And he's heartened as this shows that the, that the fame of his people is known there. Uh, that's, a, say, a high consolation for him. Uh, and again, the narrator kind of undercuts those, that feeling by saying, you know, so Aeneas says, feeding his spirit on empty, lifeless pictures. So there's a kind of pattern of that to some extent. Um, and then finally, we're introduced to Dido in the first book. Uh, so she's helpful. She's well disposed to Aeneas for the reasons I already discussed. Um, and uh, it, which is the direct intervention of Venus. Uh, we won't, I'll just refer you to that, but uh, that section of where it describes her un, like, like, tragic fate of Dido because of, of the situation she's being thrown into. That's book one. Book two, one of the more haunting, like if you don't have a chance to, well, I'd, I'd like you to read all, all four books I assigned, uh, but book two is definitely one and book four, uh, if you were to pick uh, one or two books to read, book two, haunting descriptions of the fall of Troy. So we normally get, and uh, and uh, my my ten year old son knows this because he sees these books lying around and saying which one's the Iliad and which one's the Odyssey, and so the Iliad and the Odyssey and 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 most of what we we've been presented culturally it's from that tradition is very much the Greek perspective of, of, of the Trojan War, uh, of, of the abduction of Helen and how that was so uh, horrible and, 
a long siege war that was finally overcome through ingenuity and and um, and, and what have you. Uh, but it's it's really uh, in in the Aeneid and really in Book Two that we see the cost of that, the war uh, of that defeat, and we see it from the perspective of the losers. Uh, and and uh, there's it's definitely not uh, as heroic on that other side. Um, <clears throat> so it's a first person account of the, the Trojan horse and the sack of Troy. And this is obviously modeled, well, book two and book three are modeled on the Odyssey's book nine to 12. Uh, and remember when we read the Odyssey, we, wrote, we read book 11, which was part of that first person narration of, of Odysseus. Um, so the content of the two stories are, uh, are correspondent, a lot of details. Uh, um, each uh, begins with Troy. Uh, so uh, Odysseus also begins with Troy and then talks about his journeys and how he arrived in that port. Aeneas begins with Troy, spends a lot more time on Troy and then talks about his journeys and how he got to that court. In fact, they visit a lot of the same places, but when they visit the same places, this is in book three, interestingly, there are subtle references to the fact that Odysseus was prob probably made errors. Like he, when he went to see the Cyclops and Polyphemus, he uh, you know, angered Poseidon, he angered that, that uh, Polyphemus and, uh, uh, and, and uh, Aeneas uh, treats him graciously, right? It doesn't fall into these traps. It doesn't, uh, doesn't fall, he doesn't lose everyone, you know? And Odysseus loses everybody, his ship, all, all the ships, all the people. Aeneas wisely makes sure that they all make it there. Um, so there's kind of a one-upping of Odysseus all throughout. The differences uh, are also important. Um, so Odysseus focus, focuses on his cleverness and skill. Uh, Odysseus, Aeneas focuses on the sorrows he, he's endured and the necessity imposed upon him by fate. Um, I already mentioned how Aeneas he spends a lot more time on the sack of Troy. So what, what happens? Uh, well, the with the Trojan horse, uh, as we all know, the Greeks build that wooden horse and fill it with their best warriors, and they sail off to the island of Tenedos, where their ships could not be seen from Troy. So the Trojans come out and they see the beach deserted, and they assume that the Greeks have left for home, and they're unsure sure what to do with the horse. Um, and uh, this, this line also recalls the civil strife that we we're just talking about, because um, we have this, this line of, um, uh, I just can't see it here. Uh, the common people are split into warring factions. So they're, they're, they're split into warring factions because they can't decide what to do with the horse. Laocoon is a priest of Neptune and advises against accepting the horse, famously saying, I fear the Greeks even when bearing gifts then they find this character, uh, Sinon, who uh, is a Greek that was left behind. And he tells, spins quite the, quite the tale there in order to fool the Trojans into uh, bringing it into their city. Um, the, uh, on the right there, that's a very famous, uh, sculpture from uh, from from the ancient period, at least at least uh, turn of the millennium, like around that, because uh, we're pretty sure that Pliny, uh, uh, who was writing in the first century of the Common Era, was referring to this sculpture group uh, in, in one of his descriptions. So anyway, it was discovered, I think, in the Renaissance in the 16th century, I think, and uh, it's been uh, lauded as one of the, the greatest works of classical sculpture. Um, it's, so we see here uh, an episode that's depicted in, in, the, in the Aeneid book two. So Sinon is given this tale 
and they're still kind of scratching that they're saying okay well that's plausible i guess they want they want to leave this sacrifice for minerva and they don't want, they built it so big that we don't so that we don't take it into the city well let's fool them let's break down parts of our walls let's get it into the city and uh and uh, but still they're not quite sure. And what seals the deal for them is uh, this this kind of hand of fate. This uh, this two-headed serpent comes out of the water. Huge serpent takes Laocoon and his two sons and uh, and drags them off and kills them. Um, so they immediately feel that this is um, you know the gods repaying Laocoon for uh, for. Um, at him doubting and he had thrown a spear at the side of, of this horse. I well, just want to underline quickly that this kind of notion of double motivation of the action in the, the epic. So, um, so both our own wills and wits seem to motivate action. So human action, human will can motivate events, but also fate. Okay, so there's two seem to happen to us. It's a contradiction. Either I have free will or I don't. Either it's fated or I have free will. In in the language of the of, of the Greeks and Romans, but especially here, there's really a double motivation that it's totally entwined and it's not seen as contradictory. It's seen as they're wrapped together. Our own will is went along with fate. So he says here, if fate and our own wits had not gone against us, so that gone against us is used to apply to the same noun, you know. The, uh, the Trojans, as I said, they break the wall, they take it in and, and uh, you know, at night the Greeks come out of the horse uh, and let their comrades who sailed back from Tenedos into the city. So the sack is on. The ghost of Hector appears to Aeneas. Um, and tells him to flee, you know, that the time for arms is over. But he's, he, he, he grabs his weapons. Uh, he, uh, and I, I make a note here, uh, Virgil needs to kind of account for the fact, for, for a couple of facts that um, could be questioned when, we, when people before the Aeneid thought about Aeneas. Okay, so how did he get out of there, you know? And, did he just run off like a coward, you know, because in the Iliad as well, he doesn't stay and fight Achilles, he gets kind of pulled off. Is that, be, is that a fancy way of saying he always runs off from a battle? So, so here in this depiction, it's very opposite. He's saying, oh no, even though Hector told me to take off, I stayed because I, I knew, you know, the city was falling. I grabbed arms. I got some men together. We put on Greek uh, we, we, we surprised some Greeks, we used, uh, uh, disguised ourselves in, in their armor so we could blend in and, and kill more of them. <laughs> and, but the point, so there's the point there of, of showing that it's not from lack of bravery that he uh, eventually took his family and his comrades and, and left Troy. Definitely not lack for lack of bravery, but in certain situations, martial bravery is not enough or is misplaced. Um, and in certain situations, it's irrational. It's a, it's a furor that needs to be overcome. Um, so here the, uh, he says, this is Aeneas, upon reflecting back, the Sigean Straits shimmering black, back the blaze, the shouting of fighters roars, the fight, fighters soars, the clashing blare of trumpets. Out of my wits, I seize my arms. What reason for arms? Just my spirit burning to muster troops for battle. Rush with comrades up to the city's heights. Fury and rage driving me breakneck on as it races through my mind. What a noble thing it is to die in arms. So here undercutting, as he looks back, undercutting a little bit, uh, as he as he looks back and recounts what happened um, in his in his own reflection, saying, "Well, what was I thinking? You know, what what reason for arms?" Uh, Jerry, did you have a comment, Dad? Yeah, I have a little question. Okay. I saw this part is that means he knows the fate of the Troy that the city will uh, destroyed by the Greeks, so he seemed. 
um, there's no reason for fighting, continue fighting or? Um, yeah, so what is the question, because he knew the fate of the Greeks, why fight it? Is that the question? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. So I guess, well, this is while it's happening, right? So he's he's been told by Hector that it's all over, but you never know, like that's some apparition. Like this is while it's happening, you know, like we can say it like for us, it's 3000 years later and we know that Troy or the legend that was Troy fell and it's for sure a done deal. But for him at the time, if, if he's recounting what really happened, it's those events are still to unfold, so to speak. He hasn't yet had uh, any prophecy other than Hector's uh, of that he should go, uh, that said that, you know, that he should go and, and that he should take his family. There, nothing's been laid out like it has for us. Like we've heard Jupiter lay it all out. That's just us readers thousand years after, right? So for, for Aeneas, he's recounting what actually happened at Troy. Well, I've got my city is in, people are in my city, my, my, my beloved comrades and fellow citizens, my king, my family, I've got to grab arms and help defend them. And we're a noble city and maybe we'll get through this. But, uh, but he, looking back at it, he sees it as irrational because he sees it as irrational because this, the fight was lost. So, um, so yeah, that's my only nuance to what you're saying there. Because I, I, I don't think he knew fully the fate of Troy yet. He knew it was irrational because the fight was lost, but he didn't know that it was, was part of a larger fate. Uh, so he still wanted to fight until the end, like he can solve the situation. I, th I think that's what's going through his mind at the time, and that's what he's saying. But he realizes on reflection that, that it was a bit, in, a bit irrational, if that makes sense. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, good. Um, so the narrator, again, this time Aeneas himself, right? So he was... <laughs> quoting himself and then he, he's, he's, he's talking about what happened. And then he says, uh, now like a wolf pack out for blood on a foggy night, driven blindly on by relentless rabbit hunger, leaving cubs behind, waiting jaws parked. So he's talking about how he and his other comrades went out to, to, to fight these Greeks. But in doing so, they are like a wolf pack out for blood on a foggy night and who've left their cubs behind. So it's, it's the cubs are in danger. So part of what happens in this description of book in book two is um, Aeneas is out there. He then he sees Priam, we'll see, you know, Priam is the ruler of Troy. And he sees Priam killed and, as, and um, and Priam's son killed in front of him. So that made him think of his father and his son and his family. So he goes and sees them. So he sees a number of horrifying sees, scenes. He sees Cassandra being dragged away. Uh, Cassandra famous for having this curse of being able to see the future and able to foretell it, but no one, no one believes her. She sees, he sees the Greeks storming the royal palace. And I just described this where Priam puts on his armor and, and Hecuba begs him to uh, take refuge at the household altar. And then uh, he describes that scene. So they're at this altar in this palace and Hecuba is begging Priam to, to stand down, you know? And Priam's this old, old man at this point. And, uh, uh, Priam's son Polites enters, fleeing, um, uh, fleeing Neoptolemus, uh, um, Achilles' son, and we see Priam's son Polites murdered in front of Priam, ante ora parentum, so the death in front of the eyes or faces of the parents. Um, Maybe we could turn to that section. It's, I think it's worth um, looking at. Um, let's see. 
So this is books, book two, okay? Perhaps you wonder, uh, and if you're wondering, like in the PDF of the Fagel's translation, it's page 90, okay? So that's a good way to find it because they don't have line numbers here for some reason. Perhaps you wonder how Priam met his end. When he saw his city stormed and seized, his gates wrenched apart, the enemy camped in his palace depths. The old man dons his armor, long unused. He clamps it round his shoulders, shaking with age, and all for nothing straps his useless sword to his hip, then makes for the thick of battle, out to meet his death. At the heart of the house, an ample altar stood, naked under the skies, an ancient laurel bending over the shrine, embracing our household gods within its shade. Here, flocking the altar, Hecuba, so that's the queen, Priam's wife, and her daughters, huddled, blown headlong down like doves by a black storm, clutching all for nothing, the figures of their gods. So I wanna point out two things there. So, uh, so Priam is shown trying to get a sword. So human action, human action, human will, can I do something about the situation? All for nothing. Okay, so sometimes um, there's, there's events in our life, you know, that only if I had done something differently, part of the, you know, but a lot of situations, no, there's nothing you could have done. It's all for nothing. All those efforts you might have made would have been for nothing anyway. Okay, so, so, so sometimes human action is is for nothing. Uh, and, and people say, well, all you can do is rely on prayer and sit back and and rely on on resignation to the gods or devotion to the gods. But if and the message seems to be here, but if it's not within in accordance with the will of God or the will of fate, the unfolding of fate, that also comes to nothing. So Hecuba is at the altar, praying at the altar, saying, God, you know, God's help us. You know, I know it's silly. I know it's I'm, me picking up a sword is not going to do anything, but God help us or, or God's help us. Here, there too, uh, it's, it, it's merely like, uh, uh, what is it, like doves, but by a black storm clutching all for nothing the figure of the gods, all for nothing the figure of the gods. Seeing Priam decked in the arms he'd worn as a young man, are you insane, she cries, poor husband, what impels you to strap that sword on now? Where are you rushing? Too late for such defense, such help. Not even my own Hector, if he came to the rescue now, come to me Priam, this altar will shield us all or else you'll die with us. With those words, drawing him toward her there, she made a place for the old man beside the holy shrine. Suddenly, look, a son of Priam, Polites, just escaped from slaughter at Pyrrhus' hands. So Pyrrhus is another name for, for Achilles' son. Okay, Achilles' son. Um, uh, 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 and given his genetic heritage, another very great warrior. Pyr Pyrrhus' uh, hands, um, comes racing in through spears, through enemy fighters, fleeing down the long arcades and deserted hallways, badly wounded. Pyrrhus hot on his heels, a weapon poised for the kill, about to seize him, about to run him through, and pressing home as Politus reaches his parents and collapses, vomiting out his life blood before his eyes. At that, Priam, trapped in the grip of death, not holding back, not checking his words, his rage. You, he cries, you and your vicious crimes. If any power on high recoils at such an outrage, let the gods repay you for all your reckless work. Grant you the thanks, the rich reward you've earned. You've made me see my own, my son's death with my own eyes, defiled a father's sight with a son's lifeblood. You say you're Achilles' son. You lie. Achilles never treated his enemy Priam so. No, he honored a suppliant's rights. He blushed to betray my trust. He restored my Hector's bloodless corpse for burial, for burial, sent me safely home to the land I rule. Priam's describing events at the end of the Iliad. So remember, Achilles killed Hector in rage, is defiling Hector's body dragging him around uh, the funeral pyre of 
Pat Patroclus will not return it. Priam sneaks into the Greek camp. They have one of the most famous scenes in, in literature, a touching exchange about the futility of existence and how we're all just playthings for the gods. Achilles relents, thinks of his own father and says, you know, had, dines, with, dines with Priam, uh, gives back Hector's body, sneaks him out, helps him get through back to Troy where he can bury them. So it's the end of the Iliad. With that and with all his might, the old man flings his spear, but too impotent now to pierce. It merely grazes Pyrrhus' Pierce, Pierce brazen shield that blocks its way and clings there, dangling limp from the boss, all for nothing. Pyrrhus shouts back, well then, down you go, a messenger to my father, Peleus' son. Tell him about my vicious work, how Neoptolemus degrades his father's name. Don't you forget now, die. That said, he drags the old man straight to the altar, quaking, slithering on through slips of his, uh, his son's blood and twisting Priam's hair in his left hand, his right hand sweeping forth his sword, a flash of steel, he buries it hilt deep in the king's flank. So I just want to point out at the end of the Aeneid, we see uh, a scene, Turnus, Aeneas's enemy, in a prone position, Aeneas capable of potentially giving some sort of compassion, but in a scene remnant, uh, reminiscent of this, buries his sword hilt deep in Turnus to kill him, and that's the end of, of, of the Aeneid. Such was the fate of Priam, his death, his lot on earth. With Troy blazing before his eyes, her ramparts down, the monarch who once had ruled in all his glory the many lands of Asia, Asia's many tribes, a powerful trunk is lying on the shore, the head wrenched from the shoulders, a corpse without a name. So uh, a, I think a powerful passage from a very powerful episode in the book, uh, book two. Um, so we'll go back to um, presentation there. So Jerry, your hand's still up. Is, is that an additional question or from before? Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Just. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, neglecting you there. Okay, so. Uh, look at professor? That. Yep. Uh, I think it's unmoral for the Greeks. It seemed like the Greeks decided to end the war and uh, he sent the uh, horse, that toy horse, to the toy. Then he hid in the warrior warriors inside the horse. And it, it seemed like Greek breaks the promise. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I fully caught the question. So the Greeks in hiding their warriors in the horse did what? Yeah, the Choyo horse. He, at first he said, uh, we want to end the war and uh, he sent the Choyo horse to the Choyans. Right. So that yeah. Yeah, the, so the Greeks wanted to end the war by by using that guise of the Trojan horse, that trick, right? Yes. So is I, think, uh, I guess I missed the question. Is there a question? Or? Uh, I think it's immoral and uh, is immoral? It like, yeah. You're, are you saying that it's immoral? Yeah. Yeah. Immoral. Okay, good. Yeah, I think that's the perspective you get from the Aeneid, yeah, as well, that it's trickery and deception, and we're not to think highly of it. I think it, that's the Aeneid's perspective, as I said. Uh, the other perspective, of course, is, you know, all's fair in love and war, right? You know, so there's those two, there's those two extremes of passion, and I say that flippantly, but there's those two extremes of passion where you're not using reason and more moral codes, you know, of, of kind of war of, let's say, total war where, where, where anyone, anything that one would want to win at all costs or, or um, the, let's say, the selfishness of passion. Of course, in actual Greek warfare, it, 
it was very, it wasn't, wasn't total warfare. It was very stylized, you know, you go out, hoplite battle, it was very ritualized, you know, it wasn't, you know, if you, you wouldn't use slinger weapons. That wasn't until much later, because that would be a cheap, cheap way to win. It had to be from those, those hoplites battling it out cert, in, in, a, in a formation. And it, it was about, not about slaughtering the enemy, it was whoever held the ground so that they could set up a trophy. And, you know, it was, it was more ritual, ritual battle. But all that to say, uh, I think from, from the perspective of the Aeneid, I would agree with you. I think we're supposed to look back at that action as one example of treacherous Greeks. Remember in the historical context, you know, the Romans are confronting Greeks. So that as they expanded, they confronted Greeks in Southern Italy with what's called Magna Graecia, uh, these Greek colonies that had been there for centuries in Southern Italy. And, um, and they eventually uh, gained control of those cities but then eventually, uh, around the same time that they're conquering Carthage, they're, they're completing their conquest of Greece uh, proper. Um, and the Greeks for them had this ambig ambiguous um, status. They were an older civilization, obviously wiser. They had invented science and philosophy and great literature that, they had, that, the, that the Romans could only emulate. Like the Romans did not have their own rich tradition of philosophy and literature. So, so they basically emulated Greek models and they, they basically borrowed their gods and renamed them. So there's an immense reverence for the Greeks, but there's also this sense that the Greeks were uh, spoiled by luxury there because of the, the wealth of the East. It's, it's associated with wealth and, and luxury and let's say lax living, not having the discipline, the piety, the duty to family, to community that one has in Rome, okay? So uh, I know that wasn't directly related to your question, but uh, my, my answer got me into that territory. So he sees Helen um, uh, and was, is thinking of, uh, of, of Killing Helen as well as, as being responsible for all of this, but is 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 prevented from uh, doing so by Venus. Venus tears away the clouds, so to speak, tears away the veil that all humans prevents humans from seeing the actual divine actors, the gods behind the action. So she tears it away, and he sees that it's the gods themselves that are tearing down the walls of Troy. And it's at this point, I would say, is when he, he realizes that this is, it's, you know, it's nothing he can do. It's absolutely fated that the, for this to happen. He finds his family and leaves the city. We talked about this image again last week, of course, uh, famous image of, of taking his father and Kaisis on his shoulders while Anchises himself carries the images of the Penates, the household gods, these figures of these little figures of gods. Um, and Aeneas leads his son Aeolus or, or Ascanius by the hand and his wife Creusa, for whatever reason, <laughs> we talked a bit about this last time, follows at a, a safe distance behind. So uh, quickly, I want to look at book four uh, uh, and as much as we can today and, and, and then wrap up. Uh, maybe we'll have time to take a nod at book six, but um, book three continues this story of his wanderings before he got to Carthage. And then book four describes the tragic love affair of Dido and Aeneas. So it's basically been this major interpretive debate since Virgil wrote is, has been, what are we to make of this love affair? Uh, what are we to make of Dido's actions afterwards and, and Aeneas's actions afterwards? Are we to see the actions as another example of or Aeneas's actions as another example of, of uh, piety or pietas, of, of devoting himself to his duty uh, of, of founding Rome? Or is it uh, cold and, and heartless uh, in terms of his treatment? Um, uh, the, there's the question of Dido's behavior. She's not completely a free agent in this. We, we mentioned in book one that Cupid inflames her heart. We, we know in book four, 
she's still fighting against this passion, but she seems to weaken, especially the advice of her sister. Um, and, and, but is, on the other hand, is she entirely innocent? She, she had made a vow never to remarry. She uh, allows herself to be persuaded by her sister, sister Anna. And, um, and she keeps insisting that, they're, that her and Aeneas are married, but uh, to the narrator, according to the narrator's description of, of it, it wasn't a marriage. She only called it so to hide her guilt. Um, the, and then I, I think I alluded to this last week, but we need to see in the portrayal of Dido a reference, a covert reference to Cleopatra and Aeneas as being in danger of falling into the trap that Antony fell in, i.e. falling for luxury, for individual passion at the expense of his commitment to Rome, okay? So Antony, of course, the one that Augustus had just defeated in order to, to become Augustus, the, the, the first uh, real emperor of Rome. Um, and if we see all of the Aeneid, if we see the entire epic as a celebration of Augustan rule, as, as a celebration of Rome uh, and its achievement under one ruler, bringing peace, bringing rational rule over the furor of civil war and violence and, and selfish passions, then we would see a parallel then to Aeneas refuting a potential trap to be like an Antony and taking that more no no noble path. Of course, others could see in this something different. So, so here would be another way of looking at it. So another way of looking at it would be that um, uh, Augustus has this veneer of being uh, the bringer of peace and um, uh, order to Rome. Um, however, uh, what seems to be a pious act is in reality a cold uh, destruction of uh, individuals such as Dido. That um, if you want to take that tack, you see the Aeneid as on the surface supporting Augustus, because that's the politically wise thing to do. You know, you don't want to critique, you don't want to overtly critique an emperor, because it's it's probably not good for your life expectancy, right? So you overtly in the poem support the emperor, but have covert um, thematics or motifs within the poem that call into question the hero of the epic that we're supposed to be associating with, with Augustus, i.e. was it, if Aeneas is akin to Augustus, was that really a moral move on his part to, to abandon Dido in that way? Um, so, so as I said, it comes down to these questions around whether Dido can be considered blameworthy, um, and there are some considerations in terms of Aeneas's, is he justified in the cold response? Um, I'll refer you to those, we don't have time to go through those, but they each make reasoned cases, so to speak, um, of, uh, and each has a certain claim. Uh, with the benefit of Virgil's commentary, we can see perhaps Aeneas is pitiable. He's, he's acting against his own will uh, and inclinations. He says that uh, Aeneas wanted to comfort Dido, but he had to carry out the God's commands. And maybe uh, depending on a certain vague line there, Aeneas weeps for Dido. Uh, he, he tells her that he's not leaving of his own free will. Uh, but all, and then on the other hand, though, it also says that heaven blocks his gentle human ears. So that, that's kind of underscoring the coldness of it. Uh, so Dido could be seen as our first example of the burden of Rome or the molus of Rome, the costs of Rome. So what are the costs of, of, of achieving Rome? She uh, kills herself out of anger. 
Uh, she also calls down a, that curse, the famous curse on Aeneas and his descendants, and uh, refers to the historical enmity between Rome and Carthage, and refers to an avenger that would, uh, an allusion to what would Hannibal, uh, the famous general of the Second Punic War, who invaded Italy. Um, so we could see that although celebrating the Roman achievement, although celebrating the piety that it takes to be devoted to the Roman cause that you would get in Augustus or in Aeneas and in, in, in the heroic figures of Rome, we can also see uh, the, the work, the epic as a whole, as creating pity within the Roman audience for, uh, for the, let's say the enemies or, or the, whether it's the individuals or, or cities that have to be, uh, that have to be destroyed in the wake of that new Roman order. Um, and, and maybe see in it a, a parallel of the fall of Troy, for instance. So this is toward the end of book two, for all the world, as if enemies stormed the walls and all of Carthage or old Tyre were toppling down and flames in their fury wave on mountain wave were billowing over the roofs of men and gods. So we maybe in just a couple minutes, I'll, I'll refer to book six, which, which I also asked you to read uh, this kind of whirlwind tour through the epic um, uh, that, that, or at least the uh, excerpts of the epic that we read. Um, now, this book, we can make a direct comparison to our reading of in the Odyssey, so book 11. So book 11, we said, was kind of a hinge for, um, for the Odyssey between its first half, which had to do with wandering and supernatural monsters and, and larger than life mythical dangers. And, and he had to, at least in the narrative unfolding of the Odyssey, he had to descend into the underworld. And, and this has this psychological and mythic resonance of a rebirth of oneself. So he has to be reborn as a new Odysseus, the, or at least the, the new old Odysseus, which is this kind of domestic ruler family man, to be ready for that more human world of Ithaca, okay? So, uh, so he goes down in order to meet Tiresias to find out the future and, and how he's to be able to return home. Here, Aeneas is being told he has to go to the underworld to meet his father in order to be, let's say, directed to his future, which is a political future, which is the founding of this, this Roman identity, okay? So uh, uh, a couple of things to note is, uh, let's say the turning, the, the conversion that ha has to happen, i.e. like the descent as a psychological mythic conversion of the hero for Odysseus is about, let's, it's a turning the hero to home. Uh, for Aeneas, it's about turning the hero's reflections temporally. So Aeneas had been so focused on Troy, on his father, on, on, uh, on his duty to Troy. Now it's to the future, to Rome. And let, let me show you the Roman generations uh, that will, the, the generations of great heroes and leaders that will be the result of what you create in Rome. Um, he, uh, he, he sees there then this, uh, the goal, the purpose, the future directedness of his actions um, uh, shown to him by, by his father and Chryses, okay? <laughs> so uh, that's a bit of the context we just described. Um, so catabasis is the Greek 
is for a descent. Uh, so uh, a downgoing, uh, an anabasis is an ascent, a, 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 an upgoing, and so catabasis is, is the term often used for a descent into the underworld, which is this standard mythological, um, uh, as I said, it happens in so many myths, um, it happens in so many of the um, uh, literary uh, literary stories of heroes, uh, everything from uh, Epic of Gilgamesh to, uh, to, to, the, to the Odyssey, to, to Heracles, to you know, Theseus does it, uh, uh, and you see it in a lot of later literature. Now the, uh, the, the guide, Odysseus is told how to get there, but doesn't have a guide, whereas Aeneas has this guide, the Canaan civil, who guides him through, and then eventually he sees Anchises, who shows him the future. Um, the location is, is fairly vague in the location of the underworld, but the location of the entrance to the underworld is fairly vague in, um, in the Odyssey, but it's, you know, it's out beyond the Straits of Gibraltar. Uh, in the Aeneid, it's, it's fairly specifically, it's in this region of, of Italy where there's these, these kind of sulfuric, um, these sulfuric uh, fumes and, and birds don't go over it because of these fumes. And uh, so it's this kind of hellish wasteland, it seems like. And, and they, here you're seeing it as a, as a portal to the underworld. Um, uh, the narration of it is different. Uh, Odysseus's journey is narrated in the first person. So there's some scholarly speculation that because uh, Odysseus is such a liar, and this is part of his narration, and he, he's motivated to try to make the Phaeacians to whom he's telling this story uh, admire him and want to help him. So is he a embellishing. So many people, many scholars would say he's probably embellishing or we're meant to believe he's embellishing. There's some scholars, now I wouldn't go quite this far, but there's some scholars that say the whole uh, uh, account of the underworld we're, we're supposed to take as one big Odyssean lie. Uh, uh, and it probably didn't happen, but this is part of the story he spins for the Phaeacian. So it's all part of his first person narrative. In the Aeneid, it's it's not part of Aeneas's narrative. It's part of uh, it's told by our third person narrator, who's inspired by a muse who sees these things, and it, and therefore has a certain level of credibility. He encounters his father Anchises, which is loosely based on on and this both Odysseus's encounter with his mother, but also his encounter with Tiresias, because Anchises predicts the future just like. Tiresias there. Do you have another comment, Jerry? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Go so ahead. Know you. Um, I think on my side, all the Odyssey and the Aeneas are being led to the underground world by a female. Yeah. Uh, they're, being, they're being led to the underworld by females? Yes, saying? yes. Yeah, yeah. So it, it it, like, go on. It seems like it's weird. It seems like uh, the females know where on the ground the world. There's it's like discrimination on the females. Like mm, they are some bad things, and they know where's the gate of the bad, the hell, the hates. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Um... So good points. I think the uh, so the underworld doesn't necessarily have uh, like the connotation of hell. So remember we talked about that. Um, so it's it's the underworld. It's this dark area of where the where the dead shades reside, but it doesn't have necessarily this connotation of hell and evil. Okay, so. Um, so in terms of the female characters leading them, like, as I said, Odysseus is not led by anyone. He's told how to get there by uh, Circe, um, who is a, a goddess and, and, and knows these things. Um, 
uh, Aeneas is led by a priestess who, who's able to kind of be inspired by Apollo and, and tell the future and obviously lead souls into the underworld. Um, so both in both situations, there are female characters that have a certain knowledge and are associated with the underworld, but they both have male characters that are associated with it. So they, so there's Circe, and then, but he also meets Tiresias, Odysseus does, right? So the male figure. So there's male and female who are associated with prophecy and the underworld. And then here, okay. there's, in the Aeneid, there's a uh, Sybil, the Sybil, and then Kaisis. So, uh, but interesting, an interesting point. The other thing, like in terms of, uh, say, there's a, 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 a line of inquiry I don't know enough about, but uh, could be interesting for you is uh, uh, a person named uh, Jung, so J U N G, and then there's the archetypes of the, the feminine and the masculine. So he has a thesis about uh, let's let's say what what ties together many myths and cultures and legends unconsciously. So it's, we're not conscious of it, but all, we, there's a collective unconscious about how all humans experience basic things that we all share: birth, death, uh, love, or what have you. That that means that that those shared experiences, that shared deep rooted unconscious sense of of what to fear, what to to be attached to, means that we're going to have let's say similar figures or archetypes that we attach to things. Okay, so for him there are certain feminine archetypes, masculine archetypes. As I said, I and 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 for him there's going to be male and female aspects too this descent figure like so for him he's done quite an analysis and again i'm not an expert on Jung, but, but um of this descent mythene or this this mythical uh, uh standard in, in all stories of having some sort of descent that allows us to change ourselves and to become anew and and uh, and as i said he's isolated both male and female archetypes within that Okay, so it might be something if you're interested in that, that's something to look into. And it, it just reminded me, let's say, the psychological dimension of the myth we're talking about. And, and try to do this with all literature. Like we have narratives for all these stories and that we're reading, and, and, and it's trying to represent an experience for you in a certain way. And, and, and try to think about, okay, well, to what extent is that in a way, although maybe it's not my literal story. But is it somehow reflecting a psychological or moral or, or, or spiritual course that we all have to go through or that I've gone through, if you don't want to speak for everyone. So, so let's say like a, and a descent into an underworld, I think maybe sometimes like we all think back in the narrative of our lives, you know, if we think back and try to think about the story of our lives and say, so yeah, like I had some points where I was doing well, then I had a down part, you know, but I learned from it and I was really able to turn it around. And I, part of the descent in the myth or these stories is about that psychology of us seeing or looking into what is, what is kind of potentially bringing us down, so to speak, uh, potentially uh, taking us away from truth and light, uh, potentially steering us away from a course, but being directed back to our future, our goal, and, and, and uh, to a proper end that we've crafted for ourselves or that we feel we're bound to by duty. Um, so, so I, so all that to say that the, this this kind of structure of the descent into the underworld is is tied to let's say uh, for all of us as individuals our own experience of kind of facing an abyss facing a darkness and trying to come out and, and seeing the 
purpose again or reap and just as the descent means the turning of the hero, the conversion of the hero and the rebirth of that hero, can we see in our darkest times, can we learn from these stories so that we see in our darkest times a way of being reborn and recharged? So uh, uh, even out of COVID, maybe you're, you're the pandemic and you're d depressed. I haven't seen my friends and you're going, oh my gosh, how can I get through another day? But but seeing a lot of people, you also say, you read about, you know, change their lives, you know, change their health habits or change, devoted themselves to learning another language or learning to play an instrument and, and, and taking it as a time to recharge and become a new, better person. So that, I think that's part of what this, this kind of archetypal structure of the descent is about. Uh, in, in, the, in, in all, all literature, but in particular here as well. So for Aeneas, the recharging is about getting repurposed for the future, making sure he's up to the task and is directed towards his, his duty to found Rome. Um, and Anchises presents him with, with this, this pageant of heroes and I won't go through this, but you see that there. I really want to underscore this section here. We don't have time to read it, but here Anchises has a very famous description of what he sees as the Roman calling. And, and, and part of that is, 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 is vanquishing the proud and, 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 uh, uh, and sparing the, uh, the, 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 the conquered or, or the other way around, conquering the proud and sparing the vanquished so so that part of Rome's calling is to be this this almost compassionate leader among among peoples uh, and this this one to bring justice to all peoples and the final image again that we have of Aeneas is not could be called into question in relation to this calling if he's not being compassionate to the defeated turnips um, I want to end it there um, and uh, and uh, close that discussion for now. There's it's of the Aeneid. Um, it's a text as as you can imagine that we could devote the whole course to, uh, and still have plenty to talk about, uh, much as we could have with the Odyssey as well. Um, uh, and uh, I think in terms of the themes of the course, uh, well. I don't have time to repeat all of them, but this, what we described from book six, a lot of that takeaway centers around that future, that prophecy that he gets in book six in the underworld is about a political history, okay? So remember the theme of the course time in history, there's no sense of a political history in the Odyssey. There's no sense of the future as being about a large kind of, destiny for a political unit. It's about Odysseus and it's about his family um, as an individual. So here Virgil takes that tradition and raises it up to the level of, of the, the epic of a political entity of a community and it's, it's, it's this prophecy then becomes historical destiny. Okay so with that as I said I'll, I'd like to close off and uh, uh, bid you all a good evening. Next week, uh, we're reading two Old English poems. So uh, I'll ask you to have those read before the course next week. Uh, Georgia. Can you hear me? Yep. I was just wondering um, more about the course rather than what the, the story there, but uh, the assignment that's due at the end of the month, is it the same thing as what we just did, but with the other stories that we're going to read? Yeah, so the, the second, are you talking about assignment two? Yeah, the one that's due like the 20 something, is it yeah. similar? So it's very, it's the exact same thing. So this one was about either the Odyssey or the Aeneid, write your response. And the one at the end of the month is either what we're reading next week, the two Old English poems, or the Shakespearean sonnets that we're going to read. So we've, I've selected some sonnets for you to read short poems, and we'll discuss those, okay?
Okay, and so there's no like midterm exam or anything? No, there's no midterm exam. There's okay, a, thank you. There's a third, third research essay that's due later. Yeah, okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Okay, everyone, have a great week. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.